this morning. I want you to follow along with me. If uh, There's a couple other ways that you can follow along with the scriptures we're going to be looking at. If you have a, a device that's connected to the internet, you can go on to Uversion and under live events, you'll see Calvary Assembly of God there and you can follow the notes. We also have a hard copy of that. Uh, if you didn't get one of those and you want one, you can just stick your hand up and Scott will get one to you. I want you to be able to follow along with this today. This is a really uh, cool psalm that we're looking at. We've been looking at the Selahs in the Psalms. That word Selah is a musical term that just really invites us to pause, take a little break. Sometimes the break is, and if you think about this kind of, um, if you've been listening to, to some music, sometimes there, there's a pause in the music, and, and it might be just really quick or it might be a little bit longer for both the singers and the musicians to sort of take a deep breath because out of this pause, they're going to explode into something louder. It's going to kind of crescendo. Sometimes there's a pause in, in the music so that you can see the contrast between two different things. Um, th those of you that, that uh, maybe watch something like uh, the Star Wars movies, you know that there is a theme song, a little riff that plays whenever Darth Vader is on the scene. And so you have the kind of those ominous notes, but a lot of times you'll hear those notes and then really quickly it switches into from that minor sound to a major and upbeat thing because it's transitioning from him to the good guys. And so sometimes there's that pause, there's that sailor so that you can, hey, look at this and look at this, look at them side by side. And sometimes the pause, and I like the amplified version has this in brackets next to the word sailor where it says just pause and calmly think of this. Just, just take a breath for a second and just kind of go, wow, I, I, you know, I let, let that sink in a little bit. And I think that the sailor we're going to look at today probably falls best into that category. So we're looking at Psalm 50. This is the first psalm that's written by a man named Asaph. Asaph writes a total of 12 psalms uh, that are recorded for us in the Bible. 11 of them are grouped together back to back to back later on. So, but this is the first time that we come across a song that has been written by Asaph. Asaph is a worship leader that was appointed by David at the time that the Ark of the Covenant was being brought into Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is going to become the, the capital, the center of worship there. And David is making all of the arrangements for worship to take place. And he picks Asaph to be the worship leader. Uh, not only, so he's in charge of the musicians and the singers and making sure all of that is in order as people are giving worship when they're coming into the temple. And we see Asaph serving during the reigns of King David and King Solomon. And then after several other kings are on the throne and gone, worship begins to slip away a little bit. And during the reign of King Josiah, there is a major revival, a return back to the kind of worship that, that God had intended all along. And there's a little note in there that says, that lists a couple of people and says that they were the descendants of Asaph, and there they are, right back in their position, leading worship again. Well, then you fast forward again now, several decades, and it goes on and on and on. The Israelites uh, get carried away into captivity in Babylon. They're there for 70 years. They come back and Ezra and Nehemiah are overseeing the process to rebuild the temple. And yet again, you read the, the notation there that, that lists the people and says, here's the people that are descendants of Asaph that are here leading the worship again. If you think about that, this guy, not only was God's blessing on him and he carried out his duties and his responsibilities to worship so well that God's blessing just continued after generation, generation, generation that they're still worshiping. This is the guy that writes this song that we're going to look at today. But before we look at Psalm 50, I want us to look at uh, 1 Chronicles. This is the account where David first appoints Asaph to be the worship leader. So 1 Chronicles chapter 16 they bring the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem. They have a tent set up for it. They're getting everything in place. And the very first thing that David puts in place are those people that are going to be the worshipers around the, the tent where the Ark is going to be. So it's chapter 16 of First Chronicles, verse 4. He, speaking of David, appointed some of the Levites to minister before the Ark of the Lord, to make petition, to give thanks, and to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, Asaph, 
was the chief. He was the first one that was picked to, to lead these worshipers. But not, not only that, but then when we jump down to verse number 7, we see at this great day when the Ark of the Covenant comes in here, that David had written a special song for the occasion. And it says there in verse 7 that day, that day David first committed to Asaph and his associates this psalm of thanks to the Lord. So David wrote this song on the day that the Ark of the Covenant comes in, or maybe he wrote it ahead of time, but he gives it to Asaph and says, this is the song that, that I want you to learn, and I want to use this one. And so you're going to hear echoes of this song that David gave to Asaph. You're going to hear echoes of this in Psalm 50. This clearly made an impression on, da on Asaph's heart and mind, and it was there that was working on him as he was writing his song. So here's how David's song goes. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him. Sing praise to him. Tell of all of his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Now, here's a word I want you to remember. It'll be an easy word to remember because it's the word remember. So everybody remember, remember, because we're going to come back to this again. Verse number 12. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles, and the judgments he pronounced. O descendants of Israel, his servant. O sons of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. Now, let me give you just a quick overview of Psalm 50. Here's the way that it's set up. In the first six verses is Asaph's introduction to the rest of the psalm. This is how he's introducing the main point that's going to take place. And then we have the Selah after verse number six, the pause. And he wants us to pause and consider because starting in verse number seven and all the way to the very end in verse number 23 is God speaking. That whole part is, would be in the quotation marks. This is God speaking directly to us. So Asaph sets it up in the first six verses, and then he says, I'm going to pause for a second. Selah, let this sink in. These words you're going to read next, these words you're going to sing, these words that you're going to take to heart, that you're going to ponder, just pay attention here. This is God that is speaking these words to you. In fact, he really sets the stage well for us in the, just the opening words of Psalm chapter 50. He says, the mighty one, God, the Lord, speaks. The mighty one, God, the Lord. In Hebrew, the mighty one is the word, the Hebrew word El. And it does mean the, the most important. It means the one that stands apart from the crowd, the one that stands out from everybody else. The one that, that sets the standard for everybody else to live up to. That's what El means, the, 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 the mighty one. And then the word God is the Hebrew word Elohim. Elohim means God in all of his fullness. It means God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It means the God who is all sufficient. It means the God who never had a beginning and will never have an ending. It means the God who is complete and perfect. He doesn't, he's not just the, the, the God El who stands apart from everybody else, but he is the absolute definition of perfection and completeness. And then not only El, Elohim, but the Lord. And whenever you see in your English Bible where the, the word Lord is given to us in all capital letters, that's God's name. That's Yahweh. El, Elohim, Yahweh. It's the word that, that means I am. When Moses says, well, God, who shall I say is sending me? He said, I am. And, and even this word itself is, is so loaded with implications for us because Yahweh is how we kind of have thought that it's pronounced. But it's, it's hard for us because the scribes, in trying to be so careful that God's name was not desecrated at all, they left the vowels out so they didn't write the full thing out. So if we were transcribing that into English, we would write Y-H-W-H -H is how that would be. How do you pronounce that? It's not really a pronounceable word. It's more like a breath. It's more like, there's really, there's no inflections in there. But you think about how incredible that is because everything that we are and everything that exists around us, where was it created? By the word, the breath of God. As he spoke universes into existence. 
Everything from the subatomic particles and to, to the massive universes that exist. His words spoke that. Yahweh, he breathed it out. And even us, the soul that he put in us, he breathed his essence into mankind. Yahweh. And so he says, now take note. This is who's speaking to us. El Elohim Yahweh. The one that stands apart, the one that is all of the completion, the one that just is. You can't find anything that he is not. He just is. And that's the one that is going to speak to us. Now, when you hear that God is coming to speak to you, that might cause you to pause a little bit. That might make your heart skip a beat for a second. But then when you get down to verse number six, just before God starts speaking and just before we're supposed to pause, it says the heavens proclaim his righteousness for God himself is judge. Not is a judge, not is the judge, not is coming to do judging. He embodies it. God himself is judge. El Elohim Yahweh is judge. Did you hear back there in that song that David sang for Asaph? Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles, and the judgments he pronounced? And in verse 14, he is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. When you think about the fact that the perfect one, the all-righteous one, the one who knows everything, and I mean everything, if you said it, he knows it. If you even thought it and it never came out your lips, he still knows it. If you did it, he knows it. If you thought about doing it but didn't actually do it, he still knows it. You can't hide anything from him. He is absolutely perfect and righteous as the judge. And when you hear that that is the one who is coming to speak, and not only speak, but also summon you to stand before the bar of his judgment, I think that an appropriate response might be fear. I mean, look at these legal terms that Asaph uses in here. In verse 1 and 4, he uses the word summon. The Lord speaks and summons the earth. He summons the heavens above and the earth that he may judge his people. Um, it's not a lot of fun when you open your mail and you see something with a return address that says 63rd District Court and you open it up and inside is a summons to appear. It's the same, same word here. What happens here on earth if we go, no, no big deal, I'm not going. The judge says you are in contempt of the court and will probably issue a bench warrant for your arrest. You can't just pass that. Okay. I, I, don't, I don't have anything to talk about. I'm, I'm just, I'm not going. This isn't an earthly judge that has limited ability. This is the perfect judge with all power and he is summoning us. He's, in verse number five, gathering us before him. And then, not only is he the judge, as it says in verse number six, but in verse number seven, he's also going to testify. He's not only going to be the judge that sits up there behind his royal desk of judgment, but he's actually, he's going to get down on the witness stand and testify as well. And not only that, but it tells us in verse number 21 that he'll also pass judgment. He is truly, he's the, he's the judge, he's the witness, he's the jury that gives the final verdict. And then we have this in verse number 16. God starts cataloging just some of the many sins that we have to give account for. God says, what right have you to recite my laws? Or take my covenant on your lips. You hate my instruction. And cast my words behind you. When you see a thief, you join with him. You throw in your lot with adulterers. You use your mouth for evil and harness your tongue to deceit. You speak continually against your brother and slander your own 
mother's son. There's the list of sins, crimes that we have committed. In fact, like I said, this is just a small sampling because Paul will tell us later on in the New Testament, all of us have fallen short of God's righteous standard. All of us have sinned. All of us have violated all holy God's righteous laws. And that's the judge that we have to stand before. Selah. Talk about making your heart not just skip a beat, but maybe skip a couple of beats and then begin to pound like it's almost ready to burst out of your chest. That's the one that I have to stand before. But I think that the fear is only there when there is an unknown. I don't know what the testimony is going to be. I don't know what the judge is going to be like. I, I, I can't predict what the verdict is going to be. You see, there's, there's another way of looking at God's judgments as well. I want us to go back to David's song that he gave to Asa for just a minute. And let's jump back in at it to verse number 31. Now he's just said the judgments are coming. Right? But verse 31, let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea resound in all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Then the trees of the forest will sing. They will sing for joy before the Lord. For he comes, there it is again, to judge the earth. And then again, in light of his judgment, what does David call us to sing about? Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Cry out, save us, O God, our Savior. Gather us and deliver us from the nations, that we may give thanks to your holy name, that we may glory in your praise. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Then all the people said, Amen, and praise the Lord. That's a good song. We like, we like that song. But we're still talking about judgments there and, and, and also then this rejoicing as a result of that. Is rejoicing even a possible response? Is that appropriate for us to do when we hear the perfect judge is coming and he summoned us into his courtroom and he is going to testify against us and he's going to hand out the verdict at the end? We should be rejoicing about that. Well, look at... What Asaph records for us, God's words, let's go back to verse number 7 of Psalm 50. Hear my people and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against you. I am God, your God. I do not rebuke you for your sacrifices or your burnt offerings which are ever before me. I have no need of a bull from your stall or of goats from your pens for... Every animal of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains, and the creatures of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all that is in it. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Sacrifice thank offerings to God, fulfill your vows to the Most High, and call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you will honor me. God says, I don't rebuke you for your sacrifices. Because what God's really saying is, I don't need your sacrifices. I, I'm not looking for you to do things. I'm not looking for you to perform sacrifices. I'm not looking for you to check off all the boxes. I don't want all of your religious box checking. What I want is your heart. God doesn't need our sacrifices, but he wants our heart. So he doesn't rebuke us for trying those other things, but he says, all of those can't help you. They fall short. They're never going to fulfill the requirements. So why rejoicing? What was the word that I want you to remember? Yeah. Remember? Look at how Asaph wraps up this psalm. Consider this, you who forget. So that's the complete opposite, right? Got to remember. Consider this, you who forget God, or I will tear you to pieces with none to rescue you. He who sacrifices thank offerings honors me, and he prepares the way that I may show him the salvation of God. When we remember what God has done for us, 
when we keep recalling what he's even doing for us now, when we keep on looking forward to what he's going to do in the next minute, the next year, a decade, and the next infinity that comes after that, when we remember those things, we can be thankful. We can rejoice. We don't have to stand in fear before the judge. I want you to hear how Job said this. He, he struggled with this too. He's, he's sitting there going, man, I must have messed up. Something must have happened because look, look at all these things that are going on. And, and he says, if only I could come into court, if I could plead my case there. So in Job chapter 9, he says, indeed, I know that this is true, but how can a mortal be righteous before God? How can I ever keep all of these rules that I'm supposed to keep? Though one wished to dispute with him, he could not answer him one time out of a thousand. God's wisdom is profound. His power is vast. Who has resisted him and come, down, come out unscathed? How could I ever go into court against him and hope to win anything? I, I can't do it. And the rest of the, this chapter goes on about, he's talking about, here's the things I could try, and none of this is going to work. And so finally, at the end of chapter 9, he reaches this conclusion. If only... Well, let me back up to verse 32. He's not a man like me that I might answer him, that we might confront each other in court. Now pause there for a second. Did you, did you hear that in, in this Psalm 50, that where, where God said that same thing? You're, you're trying to give me human attributes. He said, do I, do I drink like a human? Is, is, that, is that what you think of me? Do you think that you, got it, you have to give me these sacrifices, otherwise I'd be hungry? I, I, I'm not like you. I'm not, and, and he says, you know, sometimes mortals think this way, but that's not me. Don't ascribe those to me. So he said, he's not a man like me. He's com something completely different. He is El, Elohim, Yahweh. So verse number 33 back there in Job 9, if only, if only, if only, there was someone to arbitrate between us, to lay his hand upon us both. Someone to remove God's rod from me so that his terror would frighten me no more. Then I would speak up without fear of him. But as it stands with me, as it now stands with me, I cannot. I need somebody. Somebody that can plead the salvation for me. Somebody that, that can recall things that I've forgotten. Somebody that can call out the things that I don't even know. But here's the great thing for us. Who's speaking here? El, Elohim, Yahweh. Do you know that El, Elohim, Yahweh, the great I Am, became flesh just like us? Jesus. So he, the writer of Hebrews records for us in Hebrews chapter 2, since the children have flesh and blood, he too, speaking of Jesus, shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death that is the devil to free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death by their fear of the coming judgment later on in hebrews chapter 7 he gets a little bit more specific about jesus he said for it is declared you speaking of jesus are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless. For the law made nothing perfect. All of those sacrifices couldn't measure up. They never made anything perfect. And a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath. Others became priests without any oath, but... He became a priest with an oath when God said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. Amen. Now, there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, 
pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Kind of sounds like El Elohim Yahweh, doesn't it? The perfect one. Unlike other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the, of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. You see, it could be fear when we think about the judge coming and we think about the testimony that would be brought against us and the witnesses that might be there. It could be fear if we didn't know what Jesus had done for us, if we had forgotten what Jesus had done for us. See, every one of us, that list of sins in, in uh, Psalm 50, Every one of us have done that. You say, oh, I'm, I, I've never stolen anything. I'm not a thief. I'm not an adulterer. I remain faithful. But what about, he said, you, you put my word behind your back. You know what that is? That's, that's when God points something out to us and we go, oh, that's not for me. That's for somebody else. That's pushing his word behind our back. What about, have you ever said anything unkind about somebody else? Any of those puts us in violation of all of God's righteous laws. But when we remember the mediator, El Elohim Yahweh, the great I Am who came in flesh and died on a cross to satisfy all those requirements, the reason why we can rejoice when we look forward to standing before the judge, the perfect judge, is because when the book of our sins gets opened, underneath your name, when you have accepted Jesus as your Savior and asked him, to forgive you of those sins because of what he did on the cross, when he opens that book and he looks underneath your name, written in the crimson red blood of Jesus, it'll say, all sins forgiven, all debts paid, everything paid in full. And that's why we rejoice when Judgment Day comes. Because we finally get to hear that all of those sins have been canceled, that the record of them has been completely obliterated by the blood of Jesus. It's not our sacrifices. It's not what we do. It's what he already did. And that's why we remember that. And so I think that it's, it's important for us to be in remembrance of what Jesus did, what he's still doing for us, and what he's going to continue to do, and what he ultimately will have done and accomplished for us on that judgment day, and to remain thankful. That's how we stay secure. That's where our salvation is locked in. And we don't feel the fear of, oh no, the end is coming. My last day is almost here. The, the world is falling apart. It's coming to an end. Now what? Now what? We don't have to live in that fear because our salvation is secure when we continue to remember what Jesus has done and we remain thankful for that. Listen to the words of Jesus himself. Paul wrote this for us. I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. In remembrance of what? My accomplishments? In remembrance of all the boxes I checked off? No. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. What did Jesus do for us? What did he do for us? That's what we remember. That's what we're thankful for. Because that is what brought us salvation. So that when we hear that the King is coming, the all-righteous judge, the all-holy one, and he's even going to open the books and testify and pronounce the final judgment, the final verdict on our lives, we don't approach that time with fear and trembling, with our hearts pounding in our chest, wondering, I wonder what's going to happen? How's this all going to work out? We can approach it like this psalm reminds us to, with rejoicing. Because when those record books are open, all of our sins are forgiven and forgotten and obliterated by the blood of Jesus. He's not like us. He's not a human like us. We sometimes forgive, but we have a real hard time forgetting. 
Jesus forgives and forgets, and it's gone. It's been removed from us as far as the East is from the West. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? I want to, to pray with you today. If, if you're here and that thought for you still brings fear to your heart, if I were to say you're going to have to stand in the presence of the all-holy, all-righteous God, that still, that causes your knees to buckle and a pit in your stomach because you've never known what it is to have your sins forgiven. I told you earlier how Paul wrote in Romans that all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's standard. Later on, just a couple chapters later on, Paul also writes these words, that the penalty for those sins is death. That's the judgment. It's a death sentence. It's eternal separation from the presence of God. But friends, we avoid that death sentence because God so wants your heart. He so wants to be in a relationship with you forever and ever and ever that he was willing to send his one and only son, the I Am, became flesh. He lived on this earth a perfect life and he died taking your sin and my sin on himself. He died on the cross and let his blood be shed to satisfy God's righteous requirements, to pay the penalty for all of our sins. And so the Bible says that it's by our faith in what Jesus did for us when he sacrificed himself and spilled his blood that the record can be cleansed and no longer do we have to think of God approaching with fear but we can think of it with rejoicing. So my friend, if you're here today or you're watching this broadcast or watching this as a video at some later time and you've never asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins, today can be a brand new day, a brand new start for you where the record is wiped clean. So I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. You don't have to repeat my words. There's not gonna be anything magical about the words that I'm gonna say. I'm just gonna give you an example. And you pray this prayer and use your own words and pray it from your heart. Because the God that loves you so desperately is longing for your heart and longing to hear you come to him so that he can save you from this penalty of your sins. So he wants to hear you pray. So pray something like this. God, I acknowledge that I've sinned. I'm guilty. I've broken your righteous laws. And the thought of standing before you right now scares me beyond anything that I can even express. But God, the only reason why I have any hope of talking to you today is because I believe that Jesus paid the penalty for my sins when he died on that cross. And so God, would you forgive me of those times that I violated your commandments, those times that I've pushed your hand away, that I've put your words behind my back, and I've ignored you. Forgive me of those sins. Wipe the record clean. And Jesus, I invite you to come into my life now, not just as my Savior, but as my Lord and as my very best friend. And from this day forward, I'm going to live differently because my outlook is different. No longer do I stand in fear. But I now anticipate it with excitement, with rejoicing, looking forward to the day that I will get to see your face and live in your presence forever forever. Thank you, Jesus, for doing that for me. Friends, would you stand with us this morning?